with a song. I love when he delivers us from our enemies. So if you're struggling today, you need to come with us and just sit in your homes and lift your hands and worship with us this morning.
a child of God this morning. Each and every day, we put our hands in the hand of God. You know, I've been really digging into the scriptures. I'm really realizing that we need to really have our soul broken, broken so that we can live deep with God in our spirit. Good morning. Reading from Luke 11, 14 to 22. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man, had been, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, By Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. Others tested him, asking for a sign from heaven. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Now if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoils. Well, welcome everyone and great to be together again. And thank you, worship team, and thank you, Susan, for reading God's word for us. Let's begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to be together. Thank you for your word that uh, sharpens our lives, calls us uh, back to you. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would anoint what is being said today for the encouragement of your people. We consider it a privilege to be your children and desire to walk more fully in your ways. And so, Lord, let that be uh, what you accomplish uh, as we are spend this time uh, together. We thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you've been with us, you know that we've been talking about uh, the kingdom coming. Jesus prayed and invites us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Now, that may sound like two requests, but it's actually the same request. When the kingdom comes, God's will is done. When the realm of God's active goodness is present, God gets his way. But we all know that God isn't getting his way in so many areas of our lives. All across this world, there is a major discrepancy between what God desires for us and what is actually taking place. In my theology, and I have to stress this is my theology, uh, the very fact that we are experiencing a global pandemic is proof, first, that God allowed it to take place, but secondly, Pandemics were never God's original design for any of us. It's not his desire. You can, could say the same thing about any number of uh, issues facing humanity today, from war to inequity, uh, racism, poverty. None of those things are God's will. God's will is not being done, and that is why the world is in such a mess. And it's often why our personal lives are in such a mess as well. But what would happen if we welcomed the reign of God? What would be different if God got his way in us, in our outlook, in our response to life, uh, how we used our time, our talents, our treasures, how we uh, care for those that we are in relationship with? What would be different if his, his rule didn't just visit us, but became our habitation, that we embodied the reign of God each and every day and every moment of the day? To understand what that looks might look like, we've been looking at uh, some of the pictures uh, uh, in the Bible of the kingdom, and it would have been nice if the uh, uh, that the scriptures had actually defined the kingdom, but it doesn't. It gives us pictures and tells us stories about what the kingdom of God is uh, like. 
In our first message, we looked at the kingdom as good news, the announcement that the realm of God's goodness had arrived in the person of Jesus. It's an arrival that calls us to change our thinking, to repent, to do a 180 and live in light of that arrival. It's the good news that our world can and should be different. How can it be different? How does it, what does it look like when the kingdom comes? Uh, we talked about that last week from the Exodus story where the kingdom breaks in in a mighty act of deliverance. In that story, God deals decisively with the natural and supernatural forces that are keeping his people in bondage. And with their taskmaster's control broken, the people are now set free to serve God as their king and say so long to the false gods and the puppet ruler they had in Pharaoh. Uh, the point of the Exodus was to take Israel out of Egypt so that the Lord could take them into the good land he had promised them. So what does it look like when the kingdom comes? Well, God's people get to live in freedom as he intended. They get to live under his rule and they get to live in a good and spacious land. That's when, when the kingdom comes. That's what it looks like. That was always the Lord's intent for his people. But you, you know the story of Israel. Uh, they had a hard time getting into the land and they had even a harder time staying in the land. Over and over, they forsook Yahweh as their king and followed after other gods. The so-called gods of the, of the foreign nations were always enticing them away from their, the God who redeemed them. And instead of living under the, uh, the gracious terms of the covenant God that he provide, provided for them as a nation, uh, the Israelites chose to live as the foreign nations did, and they rebelled against God's law. That led to successive empires invading and displacing them and subjecting them to centuries of oppression and control. The freedom the Lord had won for them was continually being lost. They had the story of the Exodus, the great emancipation was uh, secured for them, uh, but they didn't have the experience of it. it. They had a collective memory of what God had done, but it wasn't their present reality. And I wonder if I'm talking to someone today uh, who in another time you knew uh, the joy of God's deliverance and freedom, but you've slipped back into another way of life. You've allowed hurts and habits and hang-ups to get the best of you. The joy is gone. You feel chained down. You're losing hope for the future. That is not God's desire for you today. To, brother, sister, it's time to turn back to repent, to believe the good news again, not for a better life, but for a brand new life. He rescued you once and he can rescue you again. God is gracious in this hour. Please return to him today. That is what God did for Israel in sending Jesus when he did, even though they had failed so many times and in so many ways. God was faithful to his calling. He was faithful to his purposes for his people. And at this juncture in history, and we're talking about the New Testament times, the time when the Jewish people were under Roman occupation, he wanted them to have not only a memory of God as king, but also a share in that kingdom as well. And that's why Christ came. So Jesus came announcing the kingdom and he came demonstrating it in his preaching and his teaching and his healing ministry. In Luke 4, uh, Jesus is about to start his public ministry and he's in a synagogue in his own hometown and he's handed the reading for that day. And it happens to be from the book of Isaiah. And this is what he reads. 
The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down and everybody was looking at him and he, be, and he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What's Jesus saying? He's telling them, this is why I came. This is what happens when the king comes to town. This is what the prophets of the kingdom have been declaring all along, and now it's happening. It's taking place in this very day. The second exodus is underway. A new day has dawned. Good news is in the air. The sick are being made well, and those tormented by evil spirits are being set free. So radical and new was the life of, of Jesus that he, when he invited people to follow him, they left their jobs, they left their boats, they left their tax offices, their homes and their families to do life with him, to learn from him, to walk with him, to share in his ministry. They dedicated themselves to be his students and learn from him. And for the first time in centuries, the people of God were experiencing what, through Jesus, what it was like to have God have his way among them. And the people exclaimed, we've never heard anyone speak like this before, and we've never seen anyone do these things before. Someone has described Jesus as a self-generating tornado, and I think that's a good description of what's happening in the Gospels. There is so much happening around this moving center, the kingdom of God, the rule of God. God is getting what he wants, and it's breaking out all over the place. But like in the story that Susan read earlier, not everyone appreciated what was happening around Jesus. Religious leaders felt their authority being challenged. They were disturbed by how Jesus talked about God's law. They were outraged at his actions and those of his disciples. They even accused him of acting out of an evil place. Uh, to them, his miracles were obviously the work of Beelzebub, the prince of devils. But as our reading shows, Jesus confronts them with their shoddy logic. For what purpose would one satanic power defeat another? That would be a kingdom divided against itself. And, and with that kind of division, obviously that kingdom could not stand. Their logic made no sense. The very fact that people were being liberated from oppressive forces proved, Jesus points out, that the kingdom of God is present. Freedom is being proclaimed and the oppressed are being released. God is getting his way just like he did in that first Exodus story. Now, if you think about these two stories side by side, the Exodus narrative, and in, in the book of Exodus, and uh, Luke 11 passage, the story we're looking at uh, today, there's some definite parallels. You know, in a very real sense, Egypt can be compared to the strong man guarding his house, keeping the nation of Israel enslaved for their own purposes, for their own greed, uh, for their own uh, selfish desires, all in the name of all their false gods. But having heard their cry, another one, more powerful, overcomes the strong man and takes away his armor. And how did God take away the armor of the Egyptians? Through the plagues and the sea that swallowed up Pharaoh's army. And then he divides the spoils, which is the people of God being uh, set free. 
It's interesting that even as Israel is leaving Egypt, uh, the Egyptians are giving them jewelry of silver and gold. And the Bible says that in that exodus, the people of God plundered uh, Israel and they divided up uh, the spoils. And so here is Jesus uh, doing it again in the life of this a mute man. The strong man, Satan, has been taken down by one more powerful. His house has been invaded. His authority, his power has been usurped. And the spoils, this man's life, is being taken away into a good place, a place of freedom. And Jesus says, when you see that happening, know that the kingdom of God has come. The realm of God's active goodness has broken onto the scene and freedom is proclaimed. But more than just proclaimed, it's realized. It's realized. And I think we, as in, uh, maybe pastors are guilty of this. And as Christians, we may proclaim freedom. But are we realizing it? Are we living in it? Are we seeing it day to day? Is God getting his way? The God, that great I am, that one we talked about last week, as the manifestly present one is here in power. He was there in the first century, and he's here in the, in the 21st century. He is alive and well and working. His kingdom has come, and his effect in this man's life and in the Exodus story, and in our lives as well, should be unmistakable. Unmistakable. Pro freedom that is not only proclaimed, but realized day to day. Jesus says this happens, it's by the finger of God. He says, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. What a curious expression of God's action in Jesus. The finger of God. Do you know where else you hear that for, about the finger of God, where you hear that phrase? That's right. In the Exodus story, you remember that when Aaron and Moses turn uh, the Nile uh, into blood, the Egyptian magicians uh, replicate uh, that same uh, miracle right on the spot. And then they do the same with the second plague as well. When all those frogs appear, they use their dark arts to mimic uh, God's action. But when they couldn't do it with the third plague, the, th the plague of, of lice and gnats, they have run out of tricks. They've come to an end in their power. And they had to admit that these miracles were coming from God, that they were actually Yahweh's doing. And the cult leaders tell Pharaoh when they can't explain why they can't do this third miracle or any other miracle that happens after that. They say, these things are happening by the finger of God. Same phrase, by the finger of God. But instead of turning to God, you know the story, Pharaoh hardens his heart even further. Just like these religious leaders the kingdom is breaking out all around them. God is uniquely present and setting people free. And instead of welcoming it, these religious leaders feel threatened by it. So they oppose it, even suggesting that Satan himself is behind Christ's activity. That's the very blindness, the spiritual blindness that Christ came to heal. But they would not. The scripture says he came to his own and his own would not receive him. So when Jesus says it's by the finger of God that he delivered this man, he is no, it's not the idea that this, uh, this task is so small, such a small thing that he simply waves his finger and it's done. That's Probably God could do it that way. That might be the case. But I can tell you God is so powerful that he doesn't even have to lift a finger, as we say. So this is not the sense of that. It's so such a small task. He just needs to move a finger. That's not the sense of this. The finger of God 
has more to do with his immediate active presence in our midst. It, that, that, is, that is what Jesus is declaring after all here, that the kingdom is near. It's among you. It's within your reach, some of the translations say. Remember that Jesus is the perfect representation of I am. He even claims that name for himself, doesn't he? I am the way, the truth, and life. I believe there's seven I am statements in the, in the book of John. He would say that before Abraham was, I am. It's a, it's a direct declaration of who he is. He is the I am. And now the kingdom has come in him. His power, his provision, his protection, his grace and love is, is, is what he's saying in the finger of God is that it is only a touch away. We say that, don't we? I was, I was so close, I could touch it. And I think that's what Jesus uh, wants to uh, say the same thing to, to us as well. I am so close to my people and my people are so close to me that I can touch them. I can touch that anxiety. I can touch that, that health concern. I can, I can touch that relational struggle. Whatever you're wrestling with today, the kingdom of God has come. Yes, there's a sense in which the king, kingdom of God is future when God absolutely gets his way in every way. But for you and I who have believed on him, who have received the kingdom, this can be true of us. This is true of us. We only need to realize that, that he is a touch away. Read through the Gospels and see how many times Jesus is having direct contact with people. Or people are having direct contact with him coming up to behind them, just touching his cloak and their lives are transformed. Jesus is even going and touching the lepers, touching the untouchable. And what happens when the touch of Jesus is there? What happens when the finger of God reaches out? Transformation, deliverance, the kingdom comes in a fresh way. And lives are made different. And again, God gets his way. What would be different about your life? If you welcomed God's immediate active presence into those challenging areas that you are experiencing today, what would be different? What would change if you let God put his finger on your hurting heart today or your broken spirit or your depressed soul, what would be different? Brothers and sisters, he's only a touch away. The finger of God is present in our lives. See, I think some of us listening today still have a strong man occupying our homes. We still have a, a strong man wandering around in our house. And by our house, I mean our, our inner world. But Jesus wants to set you free today. He wants to clean house, but not so it's left empty so that he can fill it with his presence, so that every room, every closet, every nook and cranny of your dwelling of spirit and soul has the undeniable fingerprint of Jesus on it. You see, he's not looking for a visitation, and it's wonderful when we experience the a visitation of the Lord, and, and uh, that's why I look forward to getting back together uh, someday together, because it's often in those places we experience a visitation. But, but I'm telling you the truth today. God doesn't want just visitation. He desires a habitation in us. See, we don't, we don't serve a distant God up there in the clouds, peeking over the skyline from time to time to see if we're all still here. 
No, we serve a God who is within reach. He's the within reach kind of God. His touch in your life is, his touch, he wants that touch on your life. He, it is so close. It is so close. Remember, if you're a Christian today, God dwells in you by his spirit. So let's stop treating him like he's a visitor and welcome him fully into, his, into our homes and let him make his home as much as he desires in us, which is completely. That's my encouragement to you today. The kingdom of God is present we're not waiting for some event down the road to happen uh, so that God can get his way. He can get his way right now in you. And it will transform the way you see life. It'll allow you to see the discouragements and the difficulties and the setbacks and all the celebrations and all the good things as well in a whole new light when you welcome him and his rule. Let his finger touch those hairs. Let him remove that strong man, those strongholds that keep us bound to the past. And let's bring our lives up into a new era, a place where he can happily dwell and work out of our lives the salvation that he is bringing in greater and greater ways in the days ahead. I think we all know that this... Uh, pandemic is uh, causing great uh, disruption in, in lives. The, the word that's being used to describe the sort of our collective feeling is, is languishing. People are languishing today on the border of depression and, and on, the, on, the, on the threat of, of losing hope. It's, life is drudgery and and that's because we're, we're not connected like we used to be and we're not interacting as we could. could. We, we are feeling the effect, both body, soul, and spirit. And, and this pandemic that drags on, it is, it's weighing down. It's, it's a hard road to walk. And if we are feeling this uh, languishing because of the, the disconnect be, between our, 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 ourselves and, and others on the, on the physical plane, Imagine what's happening in the, when that's true of the spiritual plane as well, when we're disconnected from God. I'm suggesting to you today that God is, not a, God is not an arm's length away God. He's a God who is near. He's a God who promises to never leave us or nor forsake us. And this is the season to hold on to that promise. He's the ever-present one in our lives. An opportunity to hear uh, Leonard Sweet, who is a who is a, a, a brilliant thinker and a futurist. And uh, Leonard Sweet, in this presentation I heard recently, he said that he believed that a that an arm's length world may actually prove to be more dangerous than an arm's race world. That our disconnect from one another is actually going to cause way more damage than all the nuclear weaponry that we could ever, ever form. But if, that's, but if that's true in the physical, it's certainly true in the spiritual. You weren't meant to walk this world alone. You weren't meant to, to, uh, to do this by yourself. And I know that we spend a lot of time alone, but you are not lonely. You don't need to be lonely. You know, the very God of heaven has broken into history and, and dwells in his people so that they know there is always hope. There's always a reason to believe for a better day. And then even if we don't see it, even if we die in the midst of this difficulty, there is a better day awaiting for us on, right on the other side of that. The Lord is close today. He is present today. Would you welcome him into your life? I encourage you this week to take, this, take the time to simply uh, stop. Confess those strongholds. Confess those areas where he is not allowed to reign or be present. And allow him to put his, his wonderful healing, restoring 
and transforming finger on those areas and bring them back to life, to renew them, to strengthen them, to guide them, to provide hope. He really is the as if ever present God and he is with you today. The kingdom of God is here. It's among us. Receive it today in your heart. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this promise, and I thank you for this hope. And Lord, I pray for each one that there's a, there's a liberty dwelling up in their heart and a, and a deep desire to reconnect with you in a fresh way. Lord, we admit so, so, how, so the, in all the ways that we admit that we, uh, that we often live in, in ways that, uh, that keep you at arm's length. Lord, help us to, to uh, see your embrace today, to see you welcoming us into your loving embrace, that you are present with us and you have not forgotten about us. That this, what we're experiencing now, whatever it is, whether it's pandemic related or whether it's just life related, whatever it is that we're going through, that you are smack dab in the middle of it, that you are right beside us and you will not allow us to experience anything that will destroy us. We are yours and nothing will change that. Thank you, Lord, for your presence in lives of people crying out to you. And I, Lord, I ask for your rescue. I ask for your grace. I thank you for your presence amongst us. Do what only you can do, Jesus. We'll thank you in your powerful name. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, I trust that this message is an encouragement and a strength. Thank you for your uh, continued uh, support of Grace Church and your understanding of w why we are, are closed at this uh, difficult time. Next week will be a, a time to celebrate communion together. So look forward to that time and encourage you to be uh, ready to partake around the Lord's table. Another expression of his presence with us. God bless and we'll see you next time.